I, uh, I plagiarized uh, this title from the terrific survey that Jacques Bazin published a few years ago uh, entitled From Dawn to Decadence, 1500 to the Present, 500 Years of Western Cultural Life. Modern science, of course, is an integral part of Western cultural life, and I suggest that it has gone through the same uh, up and down of from dawn to decadence. Here's how science has changed. Uh, it started as an idealistic, or at least as a disinterested vocation, uh, people simply curious about how the world works and trying to find out about that, uh, to a self-interested profession. And we should be aware, we should remember what George Bernard Shaw said, that all professions are conspiracies against the laity. <laughs> There's no question that there have been tremendous technological advances, but there has also been a proliferation of absolutely mediocre so-called research. And uh, one of the uh, discussions of that was actually written a dozen years ago by Jan Klein, a, an immunologist, published in a mainstream journal, an article entitled the hegemony of mediocrity in contemporary sciences, particularly in immunology. And that paper is worth reading because it is not an abstract generalized rant. He gives specific examples uh, and points out how much of the published so-called research really added nothing to the store of knowledge. And the chief criterion was that uh, people needed to pad their vita, not that there were things that needed to be um, communicated. There's been a corruption by conflicts of interest. Uh, it may not be true that the love of money is the root of all evil, but it is the root of quite a lot of evil. Uh, overall, I suggest, I assert, that science nowadays is bureaucratic, centralized, and there is politicized control of funding and publication. And that has produced an hegemony of mainstream dogma and the suppression of minority views. Now, I can't give chapter and verse to all those uh, assertions um, in the space of a, of, of a of this talk, so I'm going to concentrate on just two points to be made. And the first one is that uh, since about the middle of the 20th century, there has been a change in the way research is done that is not a matter of degree, but a matter of kind. There's been a structural change in how research is carried on. And 21st century science is a different thing than early 20th century science. And the second point is that the proper and useful conservatism of science, of skepticism toward revolutionary claims, which has always existed, it's become outright suppression of any heterodox views, exclusion from funding and publication, and active harassment and personal attacks. So I'm not suggesting there's been a change of degree in resistance, but that it's really uh, quite different. And uh, I'm not the only person who has made that assertion. In fact, Derek de Sola Price, a historian of science with a background in physics, predicted that there would be crises in scientific activity in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, Price had found that since the 17th century, by any measure, science had grown at an exponential rate, doubling about every 15 years. 
twice as many journals, twice as many articles, uh, and so on. John Zyman, uh, in his book Prometheus Bound in 1994, pointed out that more and more people doing research were beholden to patrons, the people who supported the work, and that they were not free agents following their own inclination to discover things. Richard Lindzen, a climate scientist, uh, asked rhetorically, uh, is climate science designed to answer questions? And it isn't. Uh, Philip Morofsky is a, an economist who has just published a book called Science Mart, M-A-R-T, uh, and he describes contemporary science as a set of Ponzi schemes. <laughs> and uh, the short uh, description of that that he gave me is it promises more than it can deliver, but it didn't start that way necessarily. And uh, uh, my book that I hope will come out later this year uh, is on the same uh, theme. Uh, and uh, an article I published in 2004 in, in JSE called 21st Century Science, Knowledge Monopolies and Research Cartels uh, really make some of these points also. Uh, the business meeting uh, <laughs> disturbed me considerably because in 30 years I've never heard such a gloomy prognosis on finances. And uh, I think it's obvious that we need to attract new members and I think that the fields in which there is suppression of minority views, which I'm going to run through in a minute, represent places where we can look for potential recruits, uh, bearing in mind, however, very much that as we look for recruits from mainstream areas, we pay attention to the things that John Alexander pointed to. This society started uh, with people from a variety of disciplines interested in a variety of subjects with the one commonality that the subjects we were interested in were despised by mainstream science. Nowadays, in an increasing number of mainstream disciplines, you have people who are being shoved aside, excommunicated, simply because their interpretation of acknowledged facts differs from the mainstream dogma. And I'll run quickly through some of these areas. You might think that in pure science, so-called, there'd be no reason why there would be a, an, a, a total suppression of, of uh, minority views. String theory... Uh, Lee Smolin in The Trouble with Physics and Peter White in Not Even Wrong, a physicist who himself has worked in string theory and a mathematician, point out that if you do theoretical physics nowadays and you do not subscribe to string theory, you're going to have a very hard time getting a job. If you have a job, a hard time getting promoted hard time getting funding, hard time getting published. In cosmology, if you don't subscribe to the Big Bang Theory, it might happen to you, as happened to Halton Arp, that you stop getting observation time on telescopes, and Arp actually emigrated it to Germany to continue his research. Dinosaur extinction... According to uh, the conventional wisdom, everybody knows that the impact of an asteroid caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, that everyone who knows that doesn't include a lot of paleontologists whose specialty this is. And one of those paleontologists, Huey McLean, was told by Louis Alvarez, a proponent of the asteroid uh, hypothesis, 
that he would destroy Dewey's career if he didn't stop criticizing. And he did, in fact, try to stop Dewey's promotion to full professor. There are uh, other fields where it's not really pure science. There are obvious applications. Uh, in psychiatry, there is nowadays essentially a dogmatic adherence to drug-centered treatment. And there have been many books published uh, criticizing that without changing the fact. Uh, and if anyone is inclined to regard uh, Scientology and Dianetics as pseudoscience, I invite them to take a look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses. <laughs> it's really extraordinary. Uh, I think drug-centered medicine is also a dogma that physicians react against at their peril. The sense of smell, Luca Turin has developed a theory, developed a theory 20 years ago, on the basis of which he has been far more successful in developing useful commercial perfumes than people using the uh, standard paradigm of receptors uh, for different odors, but uh, he's been excommunicated, essentially. Plate tectonics, there is a whole group of people, um, new concepts in global tectonics that has had to start their own organization and their own publication because the mainstream will not publish discussions of the various phenomena that cannot be explained under the conventional paradigm. And uh, the two biggies are uh, HIV AIDS and global warming. If you say that you do not believe that HIV causes AIDS, you are called an AIDS denialist and you are equated with people who deny that the Holocaust happened. If you claim that global warming is not to any extent caused by human activities, you're called a global warming denialist and similarly uh, despised and uh, refused publication. On both of those, there are thousands of qualified people who express the minority view. And it is actually the case that there is no credible evidence that HIV causes AIDS. There is no credible evidence that human activities significantly increase the rate of global warming. Uh, I have had time only to uh, provoke a little bit with these assertions. I'm hoping that later this year, this book uh, will appear in which I document these things and try to offer a discussion of how we got here. Thank you. First of all. Thank you, Henry. Great talk. Um, how do you relate the um, issues that you're raising to the crisis in science education that reason you so much media? We need to have more science education. We need more better educated public around science. What do you see the relationship is to that? Uh, I think the fundamental problem is that there's too much so-called science being done. And there's, uh, I mean, there's, it's a general rule that as you increase quantity, the quality tends to go down. We have a situation now where there are far more people wanting to do research and asking for funding than is available. And there have been side effects uh, of that, like the uh, tremendous increase in open fraud and dishonesty in science, which was very rare up to about 1980 uh, and is now common enough that there are actually research units on ethics in science and so on 
when I started in science, you know, what? Ethics, what does that have to do with science? But there's a serious uh, lack of uh, reality in science education. We're still teaching people that there's a scientific method. You learn it, it delivers uh, uh, reliable results. The fact of the matter is that science is done by human beings who have to judge the results of experiments and so on. Henry, my experience in academia uh, repeatedly uh, echoes what you've said. And, and, and so th there's, uh, there's no question to, to all of us that you're right. Still, I wonder if, there, if one can be an optimist here. Uh, be, and so how, how might one be an optimist? I suppose one way might be to say it's always been bad and still thing, good things leak through and it will happen again. Another, perhaps, is that this, this current paradigm is just going to burn itself out and there will be a change because there has to be. I, I, I realize you've been particularly burned recently with your stance on AIDS and HIV and so you're suffering from it. But do you see some positive movements? Uh, I don't know where the positive change is going to come from, but it has to come at some time. Uh, I haven't, incidentally, I haven't been hurt by uh, my stances because I've been happily retired for 10 years. <laughs> but sooner or later, reality has to catch up. And uh, in the case of uh, HIV AIDS, I think it's going to happen when eventually it's discovered that the people who are told they're HIV positive and who are being given drugs will be found to be dying at a greater rate than, than they should be under the paradigm. The trouble is that, that these issues are all systemic. Uh, what do you do to make the evaluation of people's work not based on getting grants? I mean, how, how do you accomplish that? I mean, P Peter Duisberg at, at Berkeley is, is refused access to graduate students because his department had said, in order to support graduate students, we guarantee them support for four years. The department can only do it for one year. If you don't have grant funds equal to a quarter of a million dollars a year, we're not going to let you take a graduate student. Now, you know... <laughs> I'd like to be optimistic, but how do you change the system uh, f away from that? I think it's going to be a slow process. Uh, great stuff, Henry. <laughs> I really agree with you. But one of the things that seems to have uh, crossed my mind recently is that more and more through maybe even the last 10 or 15 years, that a good bit of the public policy decisions that affect our lives are not made on real science, but are made on political uh, people wanting to gain power or control or something else. And that most of what uh, happens to us now is based on lies. And I think that's sad, and I don't know how we overcome that. Right. I mean, this is the crucial issue. How is public policy going to be based on evidence when the mainstream advice from the scientific community is not based on that. And uh, things are so politicized that if, if you question HIV AIDS or global warming, uh, you are referred to not only as a, as a denialist, but as a right-wing kook, because it happens that some very conservative organizations have uh, uh, taken the stance that global warming is, uh, you know, is a liberal conspiracy. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I need to add to your list of suppression one a physicist from England, Stephen Phillips, if you heard about him. Uh, he wrote a book, ESP of Quarks and Super Strings. And in my opinion, this book... Uh, really opens some new horizons for our physics, but it's completely ignored, and I would recommend everybody who is interested in this part of science look at this book. Uh, as to uh, 
uh, how to fight with this situation. I think that uh, organized societies like ours and um, uh, create, if you wish, our own civilization <laughs> in science. <laughs> Thanks for another example. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Henry.